Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He's done it all. Built Co-op City, rescued the Urban Development Corporation, and helped New York City survive the fiscal crisis of the 70s, is widely credited with saving the MTA as chairman, chaired the 1987-88 Charter Revision Commission, served as Major League Baseball labor negotiator, sworn in as New York State Lieutenant Governor in July 2009, co-chaired the State Budget Task Force from April of 2011 to December of 2013. He's New York's Forrest Gump. He's Richard Ravitch, and that's not all. He's just published a very well-received memoir. Sam Roberts of the New York Times writes, quote, fed up with dysfunctional public officials, with politics altogether, even given up on voting? Then do yourself a favor and read Richard Ravitch's inspiring So Much to Do, A Full Life of Business, Politics, and Confronting Fiscal Crisis. Welcome back, Dick. Thanks, Doug. It was a pleasure to be here. Oh, man. Nice life. Nice life. My son once said, all it proves is I can't hold one job for too long. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. Okay. Second to last page of your book. Detroit, Michigan is in bankruptcy as this book goes to press. But all bankruptcy means is that a federal judge will allocate Detroit's inadequate resources between citizens who lent the city money in good faith and employees who work for the city in good faith. Now, last week, what happens? Uh, I was asked by the bankruptcy judge to be an advisor as he uh, ponders the plan that's been negotiated by the parties over the last uh, month. So you're actually a court consultant named by uh, the federal judge, Stephen Rhodes, to what are, you, what are you actually charged with doing? Just providing advice. Okay. That's it? That's it. Now, have you begun your analysis? I, have, I have read the preliminary bankruptcy plan. I'm going to Detroit this week. Uh, and my conversations with the various... Participants in this process are going to be privileged, uh, and I'm not going to share my view with anybody except the bankruptcy judge. Oh, this is this is absolutely appropriate. Talk about Detroit both as a real place, a material place, and as a metaphor. What does Detroit mean, or what should it mean? I'm like Watergate, what does it mean? It means many things. Well, first of all. <clears throat> It means that a old city whose economy has fallen out of bed, whose industries have moved out, and who, in terms of the population, represents only 10% of a state's population, is not likely to get any financial help in trying to recover from the years of decline from either the state or the federal government. Okay. And that's tragically why uh, they had to go to court in, 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 uh, in an effort to uh, affect a resolution of all of the competing claims. And really, in some ways, as metaphor, it points out some fundamental problems that you've been concerned with for a very long time, and that's right, unsustainable health care costs and pension obligations. What's the lesson of Detroit for New York and other states? And are they you know, heeding the lesson, if there is one, or many? No place in this country, in my view at least, has adequately learned the lessons from New York City. Go ahead. New York City almost went bankrupt in 1975 because it solved its deficits by borrowing money. Borrowing money to cover your operating loss or your operating deficits 
is per se an unsustainable course of action. So many states and many cities are on that unsustainable course, in my judgment. Detroit is a totally uh, uh, unusual set of circumstances okay. because for 30 years, its economy has been going downhill, its population has been leaving, its tax base is de deteriorating. So it's not, in that sense, directly comparable. But one of the reasons it ultimately went into bankruptcy was for reasons that I do not yet understand. Banks continued to lend them money when they really had very little chance of paying it back. Well, wait, 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 wait. I, I read this be, beginning in 1970. This ain't a new story. This is an old story. What is, it, what is it? Is it in the DNA of the system? Is it in the pals? It's, it's in a it, lot of it, things, but what is it? It is in the nature of politics in a, in a democracy. And to, to, if there is a way of avoiding taxing people more or cutting government services significantly, if there's a way of kicking the can down the road, they're going to take it. And they've taken it in the hopes that things will be better, that revenues will grow, that prosperity will Or they'll be gone there. into a different job, so, you know. Exactly. Okay. You've looked at, as co-chair of the task force, six states in, in, in detail, and one of them is New York. What are the sort of the, looking at New York, what are the sort of the structural problems and also sort of the budgetary issues? I mean, should we be doing uh, tax cuts? Should we be doing selling off state assets? I know the answer to that, but go ahead. Well, I don't think this is a time to cut taxes, but the honorable people can disagree with that. New York's greatest prosperity occurred at a time when the income tax rate was higher than it is today. And we have a lot of unmet needs, and we're still using the same gimmicks that were used in the past. We're permitting state, the state, cities, school districts to make contributions to their employees' pension fund in the form of promissory notes. That's not a fiscally prudent action. And we're doing uh, that at the state level at we this are moment? We over $3 billion in the state pension fund, or will be at this point, that are in the form of promissory notes. Based on what? The, what, are we, what, what is the promissory notes well, based pri on? Well, it's a promise that will probably be kept. But at a local level, when you consider that they have no say, no mayor or county exec has any say over what the pension obligations, they're legislative. Right. Two, uh, they are subject to mandates of all kinds in how they uh, educate, how they police. Um, there are labor laws that constrain their ability somewhat in collective bargaining context. Um, it's complicated. And now there's a property tax cap. So local governments are suffering with increasing seriousness in New York State. And then you've got, you've got the overlay, which you've examined both as the uh, a chair of the commission on Medicaid, is that the state burdens its localities with substantial Medicaid costs, well, as well as uh, other mandates. New York State is relatively unique in that it forces local governments to pick up uh, a share of the Medicaid costs, but they did cap that at... 3% growth a year. So, but the state share is growing, therefore, a lot more because health care costs are going up sure. a lot faster than the rate of inflation. You ask, it, as well as sort of this policy memoir, and, and the sort of the subtitle makes it sound a little wonky, but it's not. It's very engaging, very conversational. You ask a fundamental, what you call a fundamental question, how a free society can reduce benefits for some and increase burdens for others without tearing unacceptably at the social fabric. Is that the fundamental issue confronting us today? It's the fundamental domestic issue in my judgment, yes. I think we made a lot of promises in good faith at a time of America's greatest hegemony in the world, at a time when we believed that our prosperity was going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And these were promises made in good faith, and now we have to keep them. Okay. Let's, let's, let's turn to the book, as, I, as I've said to you. I've lived this book. I, I remember all of it, and in fact, 
lived through some of it. As I told you, I was laid off in the first wave of the fiscal crisis. I led my building in the 1975 school strike. I worked for you at the Charter Revision Commission. So I read this stuff and I said, wow. And But even though I know a lot, there were some real interesting gems and we'll talk about. Talk about joining Tammany Hall. Well, I, I wanted to help Adelaide Stevenson become president in 1952. I was a student at Columbia. I thought the way to do it was to join the local Democratic Club, which I did. And when I found out there was no presidential activity going on, I stood online one night to talk to the district leader who told me, kid, we're not going to get any jobs if Stevenson gets president. We want to keep the vote low for, uh, so that next year in the primary we'll have more say about who becomes mayor. And um, that's when I joined the reform movement, <laughs> only, only to learn that uh, they were, really weren't much better. <laughs> Ooh, I know some of those folks. Uh, let the, you, you've met basically the movers and shakers of the last 40 years, both in 50 years, both in New York City and nationally. Sort of like a lightning round, almost, you know, your, sort of your initial take on these folks. Nelson Rockefeller. Brilliant man cared deeply about making life better for people who were poor and middle class. He, that was a very genuine instinct, not shared by all Republicans these days. And um, he tried very hard to do good things for them. He had a little bit of difficulty in distinguishing between borrowed money and appropriated money. Uh, but they devised lots of ways of borrowing money, but all for useful desirable public well, in purposes. In a sense, the cost of good intentions. Go ahead. What do you, I, I, assess him as governor. What, you know, what was his fundamental strength as a governor and, and or weakness? He was there to do things for people to make okay. the state economically and socially stronger. So in that sense, he was a fantastically successful governor. Okay. You seem to have a real genuine affection for eukaryotes, not only in this book, it's throughout your work. Talk about eukary and, and briefly go through the sort of the fiscal crisis choreography. Was, well, I never met Hugh Carey. I had not, I had refused to give him a contribution when he ran for governor in 1974, despite the fact that we never met. He called me in January when he was confronted with the potential bankruptcy of a state public authority mm -hmm. uh, that was building 20 odd thousand units of affordable housing around the state because he had heard I had expertise in that. And we became, we became uh, friends. Yeah. That's and a stayed friend. friends yeah. until his uh, tragic death a few years ago. He was an extraordinary man and very few people recognize that because he, he was a politician and a lot of people don't like politicians. Right. But to me, you can't govern, and I say this repeatedly in the book, you can't govern effectively by being above politics. Right, right. And Hugh Carey could talk as easily with Walter Riston, the chairman of Citibank, as he could with uh, uh, Meet Esposito, who was the Brooklyn Democratic boss. I mean, yeah, and he go had ahead. the ability to deal with both of them. And he didn't, I mean, the people who were around him the first year of his governorship, he had never even met before. Mm -hmm. Just think about it, it's unheard of. Uh, when everybody brings into office, if they're successful, brings into office the people who work sure. with them in the campaigns, etc. Hugh Carey reached out to get people who were talented and served a purpose that he knew he wanted to fulfill. Um, I could tell you great stories about Hugh Carey. I'll just tell you one brief one. Go ahead. Which, which exemplifies him. When I had to fire the head of the Long Island Railroad, um, who wasn't doing a great job, right. nice guy, uh, and I hired a headhunter and I found a very professional businessman and, but I had to pay him a lot of money, and I called the governor on the phone. Uh, in those days, these authorities ran as they were supposed to in this mm -hmm. independent fashion. 
Um, and not um, any, not for a while not anymore. Um, and um, I called the governor on the phone. I told him, I want to let you know before you read about it in the paper that I've through through I got through a head on her, a very talented guy to run the Long Island Railroad. But I want you know I have to pay him one hundred and five thousand dollars a year. And Hugh Carey said, that's more than I make. And I said, yes, Governor, but that's why I wanted you to know about it from me and not read about it. And he paused for a minute, and then he said, I guess he had a better year than I did. <laughs> that's right, unless he worked for O'Malley, and then he would have gotten a real pay cut. Uh, Mario Cuomo does not come off very well in the book in some sense, and maybe my interpretation of it. You talk about different governing styles. You talk about a Carey and Koch style, and you talk about a Cuomo style. And in contrasting them, in regard to Cuomo, uh, Koch and Carey, rather, control was not uppermost in their minds. It, w it was not and is not the Cuomo style. And the difference raises broader question of which style is calculated to bring better people into government and keep them there. Talk about that. And also, there's, in your discussion of the MTA, and, and this, this was fairly surprising to me, I had not known, that the governor did not return your phone calls as when you're the chairman of the MTA. Talk to me. Let me say this. So. I had a nice friendship with Mario Cuomo. I think I, I still do. We greet each other with great warmth. Oh, I love For him too, but go ahead. Of, whatever set of reasons, he did not agree with the independent way that I chaired the MTA, and he made that very clear when he became governor and tried to get the law changed uh, and was not successful in doing so. I'm, uh, the legislature supported the view that I held at the time. Well, they, they didn't even come, uh, the bill didn't even come up to a vote in either house. But Mario Cuomo is a very decent, fine human being who's values were the same as mine about this world. So I can't get you in trouble on that one. What about Andrew Cuomo? I believe that. <laughs> I don't know, really know Andrew Cuomo. Have I you spoken? I mean, I have, have you spoken to, to the current? Sense. Okay, have you spoken to the current mayor in I the have. city of I New have. York? several times. Uh, may I ask about what housing? I, I, w I would think given the fact that one of the, the really amazing things is the amount of housing you built and had built. What would you No, he has not talked to me about that. He's, Called me after he was elected to chat for a while and talk about the general approach to governance and putting a, uh, a government together. And then he has called me about the the uh, labor negotiations, mm -hmm. and which you have seen, experience with. We've seen we've run into each other on numerous occasions recently. Okay, up at Columbia at an event uh, honoring David Dinkins. Right. Okay. Uh, I become senior policy advisor to the mayor, and I call you up and say, Dick, you probably know more about housing than anybody, and you are a civic-minded individual. Give me some advice. What are the three or four things you tell me that I should understand? You know, I'm, I'm slightly reluctant to answer that question oh, okay. because the mayor is about to announce a, a housing program. Uh, and I don't know what's, okay. what's included and what okay. isn't included. But let me say this. General principles. Go ahead. You he talk. has got a tougher challenge in this regard because of the fiscal constraints mm -hmm. that the city faces. He's got the tool of being able to abate real estate taxes. Mm -hmm. That should be done in connection with limited profit and non-profit ownership of housing only. Okay. He's got the burden of very, uh, of, of no new federal subsidies. Of the, actually, the federal budget is cutting the Section 8 voucher program, yep. which has been the critical subsidy for the poor. And there's a correlation between the cut in these federal subsidies and the increase in the number of homeless mm -hmm. in the city of New York. Um, and um, uh, to the best of my knowledge, he has no additional uh, um, subsidy forthcoming from the state. So he's dependent on the ability to run HDC, the city's mortgage lending agency, mm -hmm. which is an extraordinarily successful tax track record of billions of dollars of loans at the lowest possible interest rate. And he has the ability, as I said, of abating real estate taxes. Those, those are the tools that are at his disposal.
how what kind what kind of housing do we need? I know we need every kind of housing. Is there a particular genre of housing, form of housing that would be particularly appropriate, or is it just so universal across socioeconomic class and geography that the questions? Well, there right? there will always be housing <coughs> for people who can afford Rich. the market. Okay, rate. okay, market rate. And uh, but there's never enough housing for people who are at the bottom of the economic ladder, and that's been true for a hundred years. Um, the, the, the interesting thing, Doug, is that if you look at the U.S. Census Bureau projections at the increase in population in the United States, and most of it, if not all of it, is going to take place in cities, yep. we're going to have an immense growth here, which means two things. We have to be able to house people, and two, we have to have an infrastructure that works. Yeah, we got to get and them to work. that's what concerns yep. me, whether or not the subway system and the commuter rail system are going to be well, sufficiently well maintained, the, the requisite level of reinvestment occurring, uh, whether we're going to build new schools, maintain our streets oh, and our water systems it's, properly. It's complicated. Mistakes. You admit some errors here. What, what would you consider your you're associated with the largest sort of public mistake, if you will. In other words, if you had it to do all over, you would do it differently, not necessarily that it was an egregious error at the time. Um, you know, I, I think that as I looked back in writing this book, uh, I came to the conclusion that um, the tough decisions were made by our political leadership, and they made the right ones. Um, did I always recommend precisely what they did? No. Um, but their intuition, you know, everybody remembers the famous headline in the Daily News, Ford to City dropped in. Right. Um, so everybody thinks Ford was terrible as far as the city of New York was concerned. The truth of the matter is, with the benefit of hindsight, he was very smart to wait until the state did everything they did before. Otherwise, he could never have gotten a bill passed by the Congress of the United States, as it was. As it was, it only passed the House by a handful of votes. Yeah, it was, it was, it was very tight. Sam Roberts uh, titled his review of the book, The Education of a Public Man. What have you learned in this education? If you, in a sense, would have ravages rules of government and politics, what have you learned? Well, I think the most important lesson I learned uh, was something that was hardly original. I began the book with a quote from Plato, which says, if you're not prepared to engage in politics, you deserve to be governed by inferior people. And so you really do have a great lesson. view of politics. And that's, that's the conviction I have. Okay. And I spend a lot of my time trying to do three things get reporters to better understand budgets and fiscal matters. I know, I know your desire to do and that. And two, to get young people to go into politics. And the only way you change anything in a democracy, you don't change it by highfalutin speeches or moral importuning or complaining and whining. You change it by getting in there and getting elected and thinking about how you're going to make the world a better place. Okay, so you've done so much, but there's still so much to do. What are you up to? I know one of the things that you're up to in that is the training of journalists to better understand budget and finances because I'm involved in that. What else? Well, I'm on. I'm in uh, Detroit besides those two. Well, uh, planting my vegetable garden, spending time with my 13 grandchildren yes. Ooh, who 13. I adore. Ooh, uh, I only have three. You're doing, a lucky man. Doing a lot of speaking and... Um, uh, hopefully doing productive things to ad advance hey, the things I believe in. Is there another book? No, sir. This was a tough chore for me. I'd never written before. Uh -huh. Not bad talking, but writing, I uh, did bad. I mean, I considering you wrote that, I, this is well done. This is very engaging. Well, I had a spectacular editor. 
Susie Garman. Yeah. Is the best. I mean, editors do make make a difference. What was the most difficult thing to write about? Both, well, for whatever reasons, and in a sense, what was the easiest? Start with the most difficult. Most difficult was to try to explain why what I learned in college from people like Trilling and Hofstadter and David Truman had a lifelong impact on my convictions about politics and government hmm. and how to make those kinds of ideas and convictions, how to describe them in a way that doesn't sound pompous and doesn't sound self-serving mm -hmm. because they could be interpreted as being corny, but they're actually true. And, and so that was the toughest part of writing. I think, I, and congratulations, I think you were most successful in, in meeting that. Many thanks to Richard Ravitch for his book, So Much to Do, and for so beautifully reminding us of New York's political history. It's a great read for everybody. See you next week here on CUNY TV. Excellent. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email, whatever it is. Thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it, send it.